September the 29th, 1986, this world-famous newspaper switched on the most advanced printing presses in the world. In what looks like a glass palace built on the mud flats of the Thames, this new print facility may look incongruous, but it symbolises one of the most dramatic revolutions in our history since William Caxton first introduced the printing press. This is the story of a city, a building and a newspaper. The city is London, the building is deep in the heart of the East End. The newspaper is the Daily Telegraph. So where did it all begin? Ever since the Romans landed here 2,000 years ago, the tidal waters of the Thames have flowed with fortune and profits. London is what it is and where it is because of the river. For generations, the ships came and went to and from the far corners of the earth, fetching and carrying the riches of the globe, making the merchants of London richer by the day. Business boomed and continued booming, and as the 19th century dawned, it was clear even to the stolid burghers of London town that something had to be done about the river, its facilities, and about the trade massing at its gates. Cargo ships were lining up four abreast downstream from London Bridge. There were no docks. This is the Isle of Dogs, the heart of London's docklands. Charles I gave it that name by keeping royal dog kennels and hundreds of dogs here among the meadows and oak trees. But in 1802, the prosperous West India Company built a huge artificial lake, the Isle of Dogs, at that twist in the river's story where Limehouse Reach, Blackwall Reach and Greenwich Reach loop the loop. The West India Dock. 98 acres of water with a depth of up to 29 feet. London's first and biggest shiploading dock. Others followed. London Dock, St. Catharines, Millwall, Royal Albert, Tilbury, and at last, the George V. Merrily, cheerily, so merrily are we. The growth of Dockland was a reflection of the growth of London. The town was poised on the brink of the greatest population explosion in history. When the West India Dock was built, there were a million mouths to feed in London. By the end of the century, the population had doubled and doubled again. By the time Victoria died, there were nearly six million Londoners. London had changed from the capital of an agricultural land to the control room of a powerful industrial one. And the docks were its fuel line. They fed this tight little island and kept Britain pumping. In just Tooley Street Wharf at the turn of this century, a thousand tons of butter came in every day. A week without the docks and London would be eating dry bread. A month and it would be starving. In a way, London was the docks. There's someone knocking at the gates of hell. I love and that was why in the Second World War, Hitler tried so desperately to wipe them out 
and win the war at a stroke. The East End took a terrible pounding, but it survived. The docks kept working. The bombers were beaten off. And London, which sometimes went hungry, never starved. Another attempt to starve London happened in the late 1950s and did destroy Dockland. Industrial disputes, arguments between management, threatened strikes. And the name Jack Dash, the unofficial Dockers leader, became famous for a little while. That I am the man. The liaison committee which I'm a member of is going to throw the sand in the machine. As the people are going to suffer here, that's, uh, you know, that's had a living for a long, long time. A lot of them to different jobs where they, where they won't get the same conditions and the same money. Ultimately, the solution was containers. Containers, a new idea which speeded up the business of trade and threatened the seat of British trade unionism. Each one a mini warehouse. They cut out the need for dockers. I named this ship Encounter Bay. May God bless her and all who sail in her. The new container boats were too wide for the docks, so the business moved away, leaving dockland high and dry. A vast stretch of the town was rendered derelict. The once teeming wharves became ghost lands. The face of the waters lay undisturbed. All of a sudden, Londoners noticed nearly one-tenth of their city was empty. London had what it hadn't had for a century, lots of empty space. <laughs> 